Boys and gents, I'm Rusuji Reacts and this is History Summarized Atlantic of Exploration by the channel Ole Sakashi Production. So you just conquered Iberia and you're wondering where to go from here. It's more common conundrum than you might think. Consider a big wooden floaty house that goes splish splash in the Atlantic Ocean. Anyway, this is a video about Portuguese and Spanish um, Castilian exploration in the Atlantic during the 1400s. Okay, please note my del deliberate decision to nope on out at the, the turn of 1500s. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is gonna obviously you know uh, it's uh, people think that you know conquering certain place and then you know. Uh, People just know what to do next or something like that. In the past, there has been real conundrums like, hmm, we've, we've taken that place, sure. Now what to do next? I can't invade that place because that, that place is ruled by somebody who's kind of badass and can also kick my ass. If not kick my ass, let's just say, you know, cause massive issues. So I can't take that place. I can't take that neighbor's place. What should I do next? Ah, let's go on also and find new land or something. Because it's not so easy to just choose what to fight. Now, people think, you know, when people run out, they usually fight with each other to take their land. Yeah, but they realize that, you know, both are badasses. And there could be massive damage and some of them could die. So they would try to choose something easier. So they would go to the, I guess, ocean and find another place. That's what happened during the colonization time period or whatever. So, yeah. This is by the channel Wally Sakashi Production. Remember, well, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction I did. There's a link in the description. Check out the castle playlist. Check out the end cards. And yeah, that's all this one. The turn of the 1500s was an absolutely wild time for the cartography industry, and of course also the sailing industry, food import business, aspiring empire builders, and basically anything that stood to profit from the realization that there was about twice as much globe as previously imagined. Sure, people had known the world was round for literally millennia, but what shocked them was learning there was stuff over there. Between the fully accidental discovery of a nominally new continent and the realization that one could bypass Ottoman toll booths by taking the scenic route to India, the world suddenly became very much larger, but also vastly more accessible. There is plenty to be said about the conquista dorks and all the transcontinental trade routes that got going in the 1500s, but my goal today is to rewind to where the age of exploration started, and look at how the kingdoms of Iberia laid the groundwork for this worldwide wayfaring by bopping around in their Atlantic backyards. So, to see how the Azores, Madeira, and Canaries launched Spain and Portugal into worldwide power, let's do some history. Okay, so I know I just said Spain like literally six seconds ago, but that's not actually correct. In the 1400s, Iberia was home to four separate states. The Christian kingdoms of Portugal, Castile, and Aragon with the Muslim Emirate of Granada at the southern tip of the peninsula. And this was all a fairly recent development because most of the medieval period had it the other way around, with powerful and prosperous Muslim states in Al-Andalus presiding over an ethnically diverse and multi-religious society during the Golden Age of Islam. That's a lot of fancy words to basically say it was cool, but I mean, I mean, yeah, it was very cool, and even their Christian adversaries recognized that. Despite fighting centuries of wars against the Muslim states to conquer the peninsula, they borrowed heavily from the culture and scholarship of their newly incorporated domains. Al-Andalus was part of a vast transcontinental society that shared notes on topics like astronomy, cartography, and navigation, which would become invaluable to Iberia's new Christian landlords. Yeah, uh, at the year of 1000 around that time, uh, you know, uh, Islamic states, you know, Arabic states or whatever, you know, they were really advanced in science and things. That's why, you know, more than half of the stars are named Arabic, you know, Arabic names. They have Arabic names, basically. I think, yeah. Uh, Alchemy is Arabic name. Algebra is Arabic name. So, you know, at that time, at the golden years of Islam, I guess, at that time, science was really getting advanced in, in those states. And they also had uh, some tools for navigation. Was it called astrolabe or something like that? This this weird clock type looking thing that helped them navigate. So basically, that's what he's talking about here. So obviously, uh, they they were you know really advancing some fields. So I guess that also helped these people while trying to navigate seas or something. But while Aragon, Castile, and Portugal were rich in the culture and smart boys they inherited, they burned a lot of money on armies to get to that point, and as a result, they were in the doubly unpleasant position of being isolated at the southwest edge of the Christian world and quite handily cash flow negative. So with Mediterranean trade routes bottlenecked by Venetian, Ottoman, and Mamluk middlemen, the Iberians had to get a little creative. Although Castile might have looked to be in the strongest spot, with coastlines on both seas and by far the biggest land to draw from, they were spread pretty thin and had three actively hostile front 
frontiers to deal with. Aragon was arguably better situated, with mountains guarding the land and a wide open coast that reached out to their chain of islands. They still had to suffer exorbitant Venetian markups if they wanted anything from beyond Sicily, but hey, half the Mediterranean is not bad. Then there's Portugal, who on paper really didn't come out of the Reconquista so hot, but they turned this subjectively suboptimal situation to their advantage by working with what they had. In this case, the Atlantic. Several different factors work together. That is something, isn't it, in Portugal's case? I never thought about it first, but yeah, you know, if you go inland, that is way too hostile people. Like I said in the start of the video, like if I go there, that's badass. I mean, I might beat them, but you know, I would suffer lots of damage. I can go there, there are Ottomans there. Hmm, there should I go. You know, screw it, that's a sea. I guess I'm gonna go there and see what I find to draw Portugal out to sea. In typical Renaissance and medieval Muslim fashion, they saw scientific inquiry and natural exploration as a celebration of God's world. And with so many second-hand accounts of magnificent lands just beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, it was an easy sell. But this high-minded curiosity paired with a hefty Christian zeal to convert and conquer, which came pre-packaged in a history of multi-century crusading. All of these- All of that. <laughs> Why is that sell? To understand the natural world. Yeah, sure. To investigate glorious new lands, yeah, okay. To convert them souls, okay. Th that is only one factor why anything happens in this world. It's just money. It's just, you know, Benjamin's the dollars, basically. Obviously not that, but yeah, it's money. So, you know, that's the thing, you know, every time there is some kind of a scientific explorer, someone sets out. Columbus basically sets out. People are like, hmm, he was a discoverer, he wanted to discover things. Yeah, not really. He just brought lots of Spanish flags and, you know, King of Spain or Queen of Spain, whatever that was, you know, just told him, you know what, I understand what you want to do, go do your thing, but remember, wherever you set, whenever you, wherever you, you know, set your foot, basically, plant our flags there and claim them for Spain, because it was all about gaining territories and all about money, basically. So people, you know, all this, it's all about, you know, it's all about science, you know, it's all about frontier and finding things. No, it's all about money in the end. Money is the only reason why anything gets funded. Zeal to convert and conquer, which came prepackaged in the history of multi century crusading. All of these traits were embodied in one Prince Henry the Navigator, younger brother to King Edward and the architect of Portugal's naval power. His epithet is a little erroneous since he personally never sailed out of line of sight of Iberia, but his generous patronage of maritime R&D gave Portuguese sailors yeah, the tools, ships, and skills to succeed out in the ocean. Henry was able to do this in part because he was a royal and also because he was the Grand Master of the Order of Christ, which you may wish to note is literally the Templars. The original group was abolished what? by the Pope and some fire in 1312, but in 1319, Portugal's King Dinesh reconstituted them as the Order of Christ to thank the Knights. Ah, they're real. Where's their zeal? <laughs> this is ridiculous. It helped in the Reconquista. So Henry had the additional motive of taking the crusade across the Straits of Gibraltar to campaign against Islam in Morocco and beyond. Specifically, he wanted to investigate Africa to find the mythical kingdom of Prester John, with whom he hoped to, I guess, outflank the Muslims? And <laughs> look, Prester John is one of those things that's everything and nothing at once, and the mystique of a long-lost Christian kingdom beyond the Muslim world is vague enough to let anything be Prester John if you cherry-pick and squint. It's Portugal's version of the El Dorado Even goose Even the Mongols or what? Let anything be Prester John if you cherry-pick even the Mongols were once thought to be Prester John. Yeah. Squint. It's Portugal's version of the El Dorado Goose Chase, except if you drop the fantasy parts, then it does actually exist, and it's just called Ethiopia. <sighs> My friends, I have gone off topic. Let us correct this error by jumping into the ocean. <laughs> so. Portugal's first foray was local, capturing the Moroccan port of Ceuta in 1415, but soon Portugal found the island of Madeira and discovered the Azores archipelago. Rediscovered is probably a better word, because medieval maps did feature island chains approximating the Azores, so there's the non-zero chance that Scandinavian and or Andalusian and or Genoese sailors had spotted them first. As far as Portugal was concerned, nobody lived there, it's free real estate. Early settlement began in the 20s and 30s, but colonization ramped up substantially in the middle of the century, more than being some neat little spots of land to claim, Madeira and the Azores soon revealed their usefulness as way stations to the rest of the Atlantic and for growing cash crops once they had a large enough labor force. Portugal wasted absolutely zero time in writing the gut-punchingly grotesque playbook of colonization, importing slaves from the west coast of Africa to irrigate, farm, harvest, and refine sugarcane. It took a couple decades Settle new land, buy slaves in Africa, impose slaves to colonize, inflict untold human suffering, profit substantially, spend it on more lands and slaves, repeat. Yeah. 
So basically, they just saw this as some kind of strategy game that we play. They say, hmm, hmm, that's the new land. Okay, there's that resource. Who's gonna find that resource? Where's the human resource? Yeah, let's go to Africa. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, what does Louis C.K. bit where he says, you know, uh, it's unbelievable what you can achieve if you throw human suffering at it or something like that. It's for Portugal to realize what exactly the islands could be used for, but once they did, oh boy. The crucial piece of this profit puzzle was definitely the slaves, because it's only after Portugal sailed down the African coast and bought slaves that they could suddenly staff all these colonies. Portugal's interest in exploring Africa started from their rivalry with Morocco and expanded into a desire to visit the lands of legendarily rich kings like Mansa Musa. And as they might have hoped, Portugal found itself very much the junior trading partner of the Mali Empire. At first, Portugal actually had a hard time getting Malian merchants to buy any of their junk, but even what little they could take back was worth a lot more in Europe, and soon Portuguese traders were able to do more substantive business and, of course, export more slaves. On the African side of things, Portugal pushed ever further southwards, taking Cape Verde in 1458 and reaching all the way down to Namibia by 1486. As they built a chain of coastal and island forts, they cut what on its own was an impossibly long continental journey down into a series of small, easy hops. Just two years later, in 1488, sailors rounded what they called the Cape of Storms and made it to East Africa, which opened up into the Indian Ocean. The king was so delighted that he renamed it to the Cape of Good Hope to make the prospect of more countless riches for crown and country look less like certain doom to the sailors who would actually be going there. Back on the Atlantic side of things, the island colonies were farming so- I mean, seriously, at that point, you know, people actually going, you know, around Africa like that, from South Africa to beyond, that was the first time people did that. I mean, that's an uncharted territory, isn't it? At the time, you know, nobody knows what they're going to find or what kind of a hazardous place they're going to find, but they sailed anyway. You need some balls to do that. I mean, you know, nowadays we have Google Maps and shit, we can just look things up on map. But at, at those time, things were vague. People had the hard maps at certain level, but even that was not that accurate. So you need balls to explore things like that aggressively, they nearly destroyed their ecosystems, knocking the colonists back down to subsistence farming because the soil was nutritionally broke. Luckily, there were still invaluable way stations to the African coast and, after 1500, to Brazil. See, the sailors had figured out that it was easier to pass the Cape of uh, Storms if they sailed out west to catch the South Atlantic wind current, which would comfortably carry them east across the Cape. But, as it happens, one ship's journey slightly too far west revealed a shiny new landmass that would be perfect for more exploitative agriculture. Keen to replicate. <laughs> so basically, they're like, oh, I'm gonna go with the current. Whoop, the current puts me too much at this side. Look, what is this? It's a new land. Okay, past successes on the Azores and Madeira without dallying on pesky roadblocks like the environment and slavery, Brazil earned Portugal quite a pretty penny, and the Atlantic Islands were both the springboard and the prototype that made it possible. So with Portugal's oceanic avenues wide open and money pouring in, let's rewind slightly to see how Castile was handling their Atlantic frontier in the 1400s. As it happens, slowly. Like we said at the start, Castile had enough problems to handle just in Iberia, so aquatic exploration got bumped down the to-do list. Castile did send an expedition to the Canary Islands off the coast of Morocco in 1402, but they delegated the job to some French nobles. The colonized islands were technically under the crown of Castile, but in reality, they were private operations. Portugal tried to muscle in on a few occasions without making any real progress, but really no one could lay a strong hand on all the islands because the Canaries, unlike the Azores and Madeira, were inhabited. Being rather close to the continent, these islands had been lived on for thousands of years, with records tracing back to Rome, Numidia, Greece, and Carthage. Even in the medieval period, explorers from North Africa, Iberia, and Italy had visited these islands and traded with their indigenous Guanche people. Castile was just the first state to actually try and take it. This century-long process rapidly accelerated after 1479 when King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile combined their domains into the new Kingdom of Spain. So suddenly, the crown had more resources on hand and fewer problems to throw them at. This was good news for their conquest of the Canaries and also bad news for the native Guanches. Come on. Let's not be surprised that Spain is a co-founder of the Gross Colonial Conduct Club. So the Crown yeah. spent the next two decades conquering the Canaries, and in 1492, they finally subdued their longtime rivals in Granada to complete their Reconquista. With Iberia done, they set about catching up to Portugal's maritime lead. And later that year, they sponsored the accidentally world-changing voyage of the notorious Crisco Clambo, who took a stop over in the Canaries <laughs> on his way to find the Indies. 
nothing else. Because if it wasn't the Indies, then that would mean his math was, like, way off, and that would make him a doofus, which he super definitely wasn't. Yeah. So, yeah, it must have just been the Indies, guys. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, I know you know the rest of that escapade, so let's wrap our story here. Despite the unassuming size of the Canaries, Azores, and Madeira, they played an outsized role in launching Spain and Portugal from humble beginnings into imperial stardom. They started the 1400s poor and isolated, but wound up set to rule the damn world. In 1493, a papal treaty officially split the globe into oh, the yeah. Spain half and the Portugal half. Of course, as swiftly as they yoinked the world, they'd eventually lose it too. More nations yeah. joined the contest in the Britain 16th and comes. 1700s, and bigger ships could just bypass the islands. So even before the Spanish and Portuguese empires declined, the islands languished as backwaters. That is, until certain 20th century events that I am woefully unqualified to explain. Still, what I find most remarkable about this first chapter in long-distance seafaring is how swiftly Spain and Portugal wrote the colonial playbook that other European empires would follow, using coastal forts and island bases to break up long trips, cultivating cash crops with import- Yes, I guess Denmark was the f- uh, Den no, not Denmark, sorry, Portugal. Yeah. Portugal was the first one, like, hmm. Uh, there's the new land because I can't go inland. They'll they'll kick my ass. So I guess I'm gonna go outside to see. Oh look at that new islands. Hmm. They, these are fertile islands. What to do now? Yeah, let's go to Africa, buy some slaves and put them there, and just you know regroup, you know manage the books and shit, and let's get rich. Ported slave labor and enslaving or destroying native population. Gangs all here in the 1400s. <laughs> Quick, no one tells Spain what platinum looks like. It'll be hilarious. Thank you so much for watching. Leave it to me to tackle a period in history that's strongly associated with one very specific person and then fully refuse to even mention him by name. Enough people have dunked on old Crisco Clambo that I wouldn't be adding anything new, so I enjoyed taking a much more structural look at early Atlantic exploration. As always, huge thanks to our patrons for support. Yeah, <sighs> Atlantic exploration. I mean, you know, all the colonization and all the bad side, you know, putting aside all those things, you know, it really takes balls to do all those things because, you know, right now our whole mentality is structured around, you know, knowing things. We could just pull, pull out your, our mobiles and things and we would just know what is what, where is what. With now GPS, we can even look where things are in, I guess, live footage or shit like that. At that time, you know, obviously people, whoever went place to place, created some kind of a makeshift maps here and there, sure. There was, you know, Arabic astrolabes and things like that that would help the exploration. But still, they could be really go off. I mean, you know, Columbus was trying to find India. His math was really off. And accidentally, he found America. He's like, oh, look at that. I nailed it. You all are Indians, right? They're, they're like, no, we're not. Ah, you're Indians. Now you're Indian Americans, apparently. So, you know, going to the, you know, South Africa side and, you know, going from the Madagascar, you know, Indian Ocean, that takes balls, man. So, yeah. All right, people, that was History Summarized Atlantic Exploration. If you like my Rick's and do like and subscribe, check out the Rick's Sunday. There's a link in the description. Check out the castle playlist like OSP and different places there. And, yeah, I'll see you next time.